Alan would say I was a little amped up, and so Cortland did most of that for me, and I appreciate him for it. Brown's down by five, and instead they go to Hillard as opposed to maybe Nick Chubb. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, this is another unjustifiable mistake by Freddie Kitchens. The ball should be in Nick Chubb's hands, not only on third down, but on this fourth down decision to go with the quarterback sneak. The sneak is no good. They would challenge it. The play would stand. Turnover on downs. Another one was coming, too. Fourth quarter. You know, it's amazing when you just find the best receiver on the field. Good things happen, Dan. I often say it ain't that hard, right? <laughs> He's the best player on the field. Make someone force you not to throw Odell back in the ball. Strong hands and the athletic ability after the catch. My mom used to say, kiss. Keep it simple, stupid. Mm. Keep it simple. Get it to Jarvis Landry. Let him do the rest. Please don't call me stupid. Really good <laughs> job by Jarvis Landry in the open field. Strong, competitive uh, runner with the football. So with the game on the line and on fourth down, you don't target OBJ? Keep, keep it simple, stupid. <laughs> you have the best, one of the best receivers in football. It's one-on-one -on -one coverage. He has to be number one in the read. The Browns are now two and six. Kitchens, you getting fired? No, it really doesn't concern me. It's not my decision, and I've never worried about it before, and I won't worry about it now, and I won't worry about it in the future. I'll just do the best job I can do. It's, you know, the little things that have been getting us beat that, you know, we have to be able to put those behind us. That it should be a no brainer that we don't have any pre snap penalties and things like that. And so that we can just go out and play and execute. We're going to get on the field in a minute, but one of the guys that you probably saw getting uh, terrible coverage, getting blown out of the water, was Jermaine Whitehead. And he responded to criticism on Twitter while still in uniform in the locker room with a series of profanity laced and threatening tweets. His account was suspended, the first tweet in a series of many in response to ESPN college football analyst Dustin Fox. Second tweet we're going to show you was a response to another account in which Whitehead threatened to kill the user. He used racial slurs. We say all that to say at the time they condemned the social media posts. And they said this matter will be further addressed internally. They have since moved on from Whitehead. They have, he's been released. That was what I meant when I said there was news just in the last half hour. They've released Whitehead. And look, there's, there's two separate pieces of this. I want to talk about the team and the game and all of that. But when you see him going off on social media after a game, you had an interesting thought. Yeah, I mean, I just felt like, like what a soft move, right? Like, he responded to a tweet from someone that talked about the blown coverage. It was blown coverage. It was awful. They didn't tackle and they looked terrible. He admitted that he had an awful game, but for you to lose it, I would like for you to peruse the Twitter timelines or Instagram timelines of any woman that is on television mm -hmm. that has the unmitigated gall to do things like pick one side versus another in a game and see the kind of things that we have to deal with and the kind of things people say to us. You got fired because you couldn't handle someone saying what was quite obvious that your coverage sucked. And it is such an incredibly soft move. Mm -hmm. Grow a woman up. Mm. Ooh. Ooh. Well said. Now let's spin it. Right? So the period, new paragraph. Now let's spin it to what this means about the team. Because you had Odell Beckham, who apparently coming off the field said, I can't get a ball thrown to me. He's tried to hold it together all year long. Is this an indication or in any way do we think this is a team right now, Pat, that is falling apart at the seam? Yeah, I think that's an indication of a peek inside the locker room. Yes, Odell Beckham has handled this incredibly professionally. I, I think that is something that should be taken away from this Browns disaster that has been this year that more people should talk about. Odell Beckham has handled not being a target, not being a threat, and being on a losing team that stinks in a very mature manner. But this type of situation with Whitehead, there's obviously a lot of frustrations inside the locker room, and there should be. You go back week after week, there's terrible decisions being made by your head coach. When your head coach is not putting you in positions to win games, you can get frustrated because in high school football, whenever the head coach speaks, you go, oh, that guy knows football better than I do. I'm going to listen to it. In college, same type of thing. But in the NFL, you're more so peers. We all have good football IQs. We're all getting paid a lot of money to do this. And whenever the guy that's sitting at the top of the tower, when the man that is making all the decisions for the offense is just doing it in a terrible fashion week in, week out, you would think at some point everybody's going to explode. A couple people on Twitter got the raw end of it there from Whitehead, but I would assume the rest of the team is starting to do it. And this is when they say that the head coach has lost the lock. Yeah, absolutely. And you know what? I agree with everything you said right there. I will say this. The Browns finally did something right. Get, get rid of that guy mm. uh, off your team. I mean, there's, there's no place for that. It's ridiculous. Now, with that being said, there's other moves that need to be made. For example. And uh, Freddie Kitchens. It, and, you know, he says he's not going to get fired. You're right. You're not going to get fired right now. But at the end of the year, oh, yes, you are. Because you can't have this kind of talent and, and be two and six or whatever it is right now. It's absolutely ridiculous. And you know what? I, it, for me, 
when you take a guy, you were on a coaching staff that had not one but two coaches, and you re and you ended up getting the head coaching job. Gee, something doesn't smell right to me. So you know what? Well, I, I don't feel sorry. For let you. me point out that one of those two was Hugh Jackson, who got fired yep. last year when they were two five and one, with much lower expectations and no Odell oh. Beckham Jr. The question is, would making a coaching change right now make a difference? The Brown season. If it hasn't already slipped hopelessly away, is on the precipice of that. Ooh. Would making that change right now make a difference? Well, I mean, if you have a person in place that you believe in to step into that role, I, I think it's it's hard to not make a move right now, Greeny. I mean, this is a team that is overpromised and underdelivered. Mm. And how can you justify if you're John Dorsey, who built a good football, a talented football team? How can you sit there and go? Freddie's the right guy for the job right now. They're eight games into a season that they're two and six and should be at worst a four and four football team. And so look, the criticism of him slash them is all the stuff that is his purview. Also, it's Nick Chubb not being on the field at moments when it seems unjustifiable. Obvious. It's not throwing the ball to Odell in big spots. That's directly under him. Penalties, you, you name it. You're talking about yeah. situations. Those football, are all head coaches. Terrible. But my Discipline, point is the things terrible. they're bad at are the things he's supposed to be good at. Correct. And so then what where is the evidence? Because I was a believer in him coming off of last year. Where is the evidence this year that he knows how to run your football team, lead your football team, control your football team, and inspire your football team? Here's evidence that, that none of this is going on. You heard Baker Mayfield in the press conference talk about how, well, we've really prepared well for two weeks. Hmm. What happened to all the weeks going into, into they, this now, these they, last two weeks? They just, because he's not prepared. They're the, they lead the NFL in penalties. They just this past week started having individual um, consequences for those penalties. They just started running because of the penalty these, they occurred in games. It's week nine. He's in way over his head, and yeah. everything is going to start falling to kitchen's table. It, it is okay. most likely. <laughs> and it's probably over anyway because we showed you the Ravens <laughs> won. Guess who else won yesterday? The Steelers won. The Steelers with a season in which everything has gone. All right. Pat, where's Pat, your pun? Where's your pun? Right. They, they, they may not have if Jacoby Brissett doesn't get hurt in this game, which he does on yeah. this play. You're going to see his knee get caught, get rolled up on here by his, his own player. Yeah, it's, it's a scary and a tough moment for Brissett. He gets stepped on and then rolled into his knee. And for a player that's really become the leader of this organization, you only hope he's okay. Uh, Brian Hoyer threw three touchdowns, however, in, in, in his place. Colts are down 26. 624. Hoyer, you see the time left. Two minutes and change. Throws one up for Zach Pascal. There's a flag on the play for defensive pass interference. There were a variety of very questionable calls in this game. That's a different conversation for a different time. It all ends up with this. Adam Vinatieri, 43 yards for the win for the Colts. Pat McAfee, let's talk. The most clutch human in the history of sports and had a rough day to begin with. But whenever the long snapper snaps, laces directly back to the holder. Holder doesn't help out. And Vinny has to kick the laces. It's almost a guaranteed pull. The laces is where the ball is the softest. So whenever your foot hits it, it wraps around your foot a little bit longer like a slingshot and can get pulled. They say the chili dip was the reason. He does that on every kick. So let's not judge that. Laces can be a real problem for a kicker because of the situation I just said. And again, you told us it's the snapper's fault there, not the holder's fault. Yeah. Finkel, Einhorn, Marino. I don't know who the snapper was, but that's who Finkel should have been trying to kill in that movie. In the meantime, look at this. Look at the AFC North. The Browns are a whole lot closer to the Bengals than they are to the Ravens, and right now their chances of making the playoffs are awfully close to zero. Meanwhile, in the same conference, you had the Chiefs yesterday at home against the Vikings playing shorthanded. Again, no Mahomes. Matt Moore is the quarterback. And I tell you what, Tyreek Hill, if you think he's just a small, fast guy, boy, are you missing the case. Absolutely, Greeny. He's become one of the elite receivers in the NFL. He's become really good at route running. And then his hands, the stretch for this catch, and then the lunge for the end zone. He's a difference maker for this offense. But if you're wondering how fast he is, just watch this play. This is a Damian Williams 91-yard touchdown. And look at Tyreek Hill catch up to him, Rex. No, that's ridiculous. I mean, you can't be this fast. <laughs> he's not human. He's a cheetah. <laughs> On the telecast, they said he ran 22 miles an hour on that play. Chiefs up 17-16. Fourth quarter, Vikings are down four. Kirk Cousins feeling got hurt in this game. He's going to find his big tight end, Kyle Rudolph. Really good right there by Cousins, staring to the right, getting the defense to move, and finding Rudolph in the back of the end zone. So the Vikings have the lead. Now it's tied. A minute left, and here's a big moment. The Chiefs had a second and 21, and they pick it up. First on the pass to Kelsey there. That makes it third manageable. 
Then Moore finding Tyree Kill. It sets up Harrison Butker. McAfee take it away. 44-yard attempt right in the middle of the field. Hold by Colquitt. And this one is absolutely slaughtered for a big-time win for the Kool-Aid man, Andy Reid and the Chiefs. <laughs> Patty Mahomes dislocated kneecap looking incredibly fresh, celebrating and bouncing around. Chiefs, that's a huge win. Moore, 275 yards. They steal one, right? It sort of feels yeah. that way. I know they're playing at home, and the Vikings aren't the 85 Bears. But to go into that game without Mahomes and win, it feels like you steal one. Yeah, it feels like you almost saved your season in a way. Because if you lose that game, you're five and four, and then you play a, a, a competitive Tennessee game next next week. And so you saw that in their celebration after the game, where everyone, it, it, you know, it wasn't just it didn't have the feel of just another regular season when you beat a playoff caliber team in Minnesota. You did it without a bunch of starters, and the way that it happened because you showed that you got some difference makers on your football team, right? Like. Tyreek Hill is becoming a difference maker, not just a fast guy that you can maybe throw some deep shots to down in the field. And then Chris Jones becoming a difference maker for their defensive line. It, it just felt like, man, now we've kept the number two seed in the AFC playoff picture. We've kept that in our, in our viewpoint. But looking on the other side of things, right, if only someone would have quite pedally.